Hello there, how's it going? Uh, I just wanted to quickly jump on uh, the video and tell you a little bit about uh, my upcoming decentering practice, Atheism for Lent. Yes, you've had Christmas, you've had Thanksgiving, but the happiest time of year is the deep exploration of the nothing, negation. And um, basically, I guess I'll give a little bit of background to what a decentering practice is, and then I'll talk more specifically about Atheism for Lent. Um, you've heard the phrase centering practices and uh, there's nothing wrong with centering practices they're ubiquitous today uh, and they're I guess a series of practices that people do in order to bring peace to themselves to kind of bring focus to get rid of distractions to try to be basically centered um, the only thing is that uh, in our personal lives and in actually the development of history and society and the sciences, the biggest innovations often happen uh, with what Thomas Kuhn called um, uh, a paradigm shift, right? Uh, a paradigm shift is really a decentering moment. It's a moment whenever everything shifts, uh, everything that we took for granted suddenly uh, seems strange and new possibilities open up. And of course, you can think of the kind of some of the the main decentering events uh, that that we've experienced in terms of um, the sciences, in terms of human uh, intellectual development. Uh, they include the Copernican Revolution, which was a type of decentering in which we uh, were no longer seen as part of or the center of the universe. And the Copernican Revolution, of course, uh, gave rise to you know, radical developments in science, in physics. Then you have the Darwinian decentering event where uh, Darwin situates us within the rest of the biological kingdom. Uh, so we are no longer some sort of central uh, place within creation. Uh, and that of course also gave rise to radical development uh, in biology. And you have of course then the Freudian uh, decentering event where uh, Freud kind of decenters Darwin by saying that uh, we are a particular type of creature that doesn't even have a center. We're not at one with ourselves. Like, you know, a dog doesn't go, what does it mean to be a dog? Uh, but a human says, what does it mean to be a human? We are not at one with ourselves. We are decentered, and that's, you know, the unconscious. So these are just a few examples of how decentering practices have uh, been uh, an incredibly important part of our development. Uh, and so decentering practices are practices that are designed to help destabilize you. They're a type of discourse, a dis dash course, that is designed to send you off course and put you onto a new course. Now, we can't live in a destabilized universe for very long. Um, these are moments in our lives where we need to open ourselves up to that. Even therapy is a form of decentering practice because you go in, you lie on the couch, and you begin to talk about difficult things, and all of the world that you've constructed begins to collapse in, in, in that kind of environment. So, decentering practices are designed to give you that destabilizing experience in some way, in a positive way that leads to a fundamental transformation. They are adventures into the negative, right? They're adventures into the tremor of the real, into the deadlock or antagonisms that um, surround us and are within us, even to say the, the antagonisms and the deadlocks that we are. So atheism for Lent, what is it? Um, over, very, very practically, over Lent, for every day of Lent, you get a reflection. It might be a reading, it might be something to listen to, it might be a piece of music, it might be a comic book, um, but every day has a reflection. And they're usually pretty short. Some of them are five minutes, some of them are a bit longer. Um, and uh, I don't expect everybody to get through them all. It's quite a challenge. It's like, you know, it's the equivalent of uh, climbing a mountain, right? You're gonna have to put a bit of work into it. Uh, but, uh, you know, you'll probably get, you, if you put the work in, you'll, you'll get to do them all. Otherwise, you might want to do half of the reflections uh, and then like save the others for a later time. But basically, a reflection for every day of Lent and once a week I give a seminar that grounds 
the readings of that week, try to give you kind of a sense of what's going on within them. And it is a uh, journey into negation. And of course, Lent is a great time to do that because Lent is about giving up, right? So whenever uh, people do Lent, they give up chocolate or marzipan or television or whatever it is, right? But this is where you give up God or you give up the absolute, right? So um, you kind of engage in a radical purging and you enter into that experience and discover it as actually a spiritual experience. There's, in fact, the, the end of Lent is where we encounter the cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which is the absolute experiencing the purging of the absolute. So it kind of mounts up to that time. And we're, each week has a different kind of emphasis. So the first few days, the very beginning, is just getting yourself, yourself situated in what's going to happen. Um, looking at the idea that actually negation has always been a part of spirituality and a part of theology and a part of theism. Negation is not the opposite. So atheism is a form of negation, atheism. Uh, and it's often then seen as the opposite of theism, which is a positive claim. But what we'll discover is that in the realms of the deepest forms of spirituality and theology and uh, materialism and theism, negation has always played a part. And we're going to follow that journey and every week it's going to get a bit deeper and it's going to get a bit more surreal. Uh, until we get to this idea of a negation at the very heart of reality. So to begin with, we situate ourselves. Uh, I guess my favourite reflection that week is just from a comic book called Knight and Squire, <laughs> where it's basically Knight and Squire are like Batman and Robin, but they're a bit rubbish. Um, they're kind of the British version of Batman and Robin. And they have, there's all these supervillains in uh, the UK as well, and they're kind of pale imitations of all of the cool superheroes and supervillains that Batman and Robin engage with. Uh, for example, there's a, there's a guy, who, I think he looks like a butler, who's very obsessed with the Joker and wants to be like the Joker, but he can't bring himself to kill people, so he, uh, he just kind of like dresses the part. And uh, basically in this universe, there's a pub called Time in a Bottle, and Time in a Bottle is this pub in the centre of London that has a spell over it, this uh, truce spell by Merlin. And uh, it means that nobody can fight when they're in the bar. So it's where all the superheroes and the supervillains go on a Thursday night to play darts, have a pint and just relax. And at, when you leave the bar, you disappear and you uh, reappear somewhere randomly in London so nobody can follow anybody. And... Uh, the beginning of the comic is when they're when you know a knight and squire are in time in a bottle and you get to meet some of the villains and some of the heroes and you see that actually you know the the superheroes are not as heroic as you imagine the villains aren't as villainous as you imagine and basically it's a space in which uh these two seemingly opposing sides can communicate in a healthy productive way and of course, that's similar to what we're doing with the Atheism for Lent. We're bringing together two supposed enemies and uh, we're showing how they might interact in much more interesting ways. But after the first few days, uh, we jump into the basic uh, kind of very standard negation of atheism, the atheism that you all know, uh, the kind of atheism that you see on YouTube. Uh, but we look at the origins of that. We look at some of the greatest critiques of the notion of God. And we walk around those critiques for the first like proper week. Then the second week, we look at the, how that negation is enveloped by the early mystics who actually embrace that atheistic negation um, and do so at a very radical level. And how they uh, use it to try to explore the idea that the transcendent reality that religion is responding to in a kind of hymn of praise, uh, is something that is beyond conception. And therefore, every time we have a theism, every time we name what that is, we have to have an atheism, we have to dename it and say that that is not what we're talking about. Hence, Meister Eckhart says, may God rid me of God. Uh, this is most clearly or most uh, precisely seen in the work of Anselm, who has this fascinating argument that we'll look at uh, where he says that uh, there's three levels of being, 
right? Or we can, we can conceptualize three levels in which something can exist. Uh, one is something that exists in the mind, but not in reality. So I can imagine all sorts of things like Sherlock Holmes or unicorns that exist in my mind, but not in reality. Uh, I can imagine a book that I'd like to write. Then there's something that can exist in the mind and in reality, and that's our daily life, right? So I can actually write that book, and now the book exists in my mind and also in reality. Or I can paint a painting. At first, the painting or the cake is just in my mind, but when I bake the cake or paint the painting, now it exists in my mind and there is a form of it in reality. And then Anselm says, it's possible for something to exist in reality that cannot be contained by the mind. Right? That's a saturated phenomenon, as jean luc Marion would say. It's something that exists uh, beyond conception, the noumenal. And Anselm says, if the word God means anything, it means a being that exists in reality that cannot be contained by the mind. And then this allows for a very interesting type of negation within mysticism that embraces a radical form of what can be called denomination. It's actually interesting that churches are called denominations because to nominate means to name and to denominate means to unname. And for many of the mystics, the point of the church is to denominate, to dename, to keep us humble about what we say about ultimate reality. Um, and to kind of protect that from, make, protect us from making gold calves out of, or graven images out of the transcendent. So that, that kind of already starts to have this really interesting relationship between kind of standard atheism, standard negation, and mystical negation. Then the week after that, we jump into really what could be called the imminent critique. And uh, this is kicked off yeah, you can, there's lots of important figures, but you can see it really being kicked off by Ludwig Feuerbach. Uh, Feuerbach is brilliant. He says he's a friend of the theologians. He's really interested in theology. He's a, he's a brilliant scholar of Luther, great philosopher, um, comes straight after Hegel. And what he does is he kind of says that, that theology is anthropology. He, his, his claim is that he wants to negate the mystics. And the reason why he wants to do that is he says, right, that's fine what the mystics are doing. That's great, Try, trying to kind of delineate what we cannot speak of. But he says, but to be honest with you, religion in its earthy form has always been about what we can speak of. It's about real liberation. It's about giving real water to people, real food to people, real clues to people. It's about trying to extend justice and love and mercy. And he says, so religion at its core, and you see this very much within Judaism, uh, is not so much about belief in God and obsessing over the, the kind of mystical notions, but rather about how one lives in community with others, how one treats one's neighbor. And uh, maybe a, an example of this would be, uh, you know, obviously Emmanuel Levinas, uh, Levinas who defines atheism and theism in terms of whether one is closed off to one's neighbor or whether one is open to one's neighbor. So for him as a, as a Jewish scholar and philosopher, he at one stage, I think it's in totality and infinity, he talks about atheism as that closure of oneself to the cry of the other. And the cry of the other is, do not murder me. So, so in other words, the other is always saying, the face of the other is always saying, do not abuse me, do not murder me, do not objectify me to, the, to where my subjectivity is lost. And when we do not hear the universe crying out that prayer to us, we are atheistic. And we are theistic whenever we are open to hearing that call, when that call haunts us, when we walk around the streets and we feel it, right? And he doesn't then go, and it's also about believing in God. No, it's very much very earthy. And Feuerbach is kind of in that broad tradition. He says, yeah, the mystics are kind of like delineating this impossibility, this transcendent noumenal force. But actually, you read this, these texts, and even you look at someone like Luther, and you go like, these people are dealing with real anxieties, real injustices, real suffering in the world. And he wants to basically concentrate on that. Uh, and then that opens the way up for more kind of radical critiques. Um, so we'll be looking at people like um, 
uh, we'll look at Marx and we'll look at um, Goldstein and a few others who who really radically attack religion because it doesn't embrace this imminent desire to um, uh, embrace the earth, but kind of gets itself caught up in otherworldliness. So then that's it. So that's a type of then negation of the mystics. Oh, and by the way, you'll notice, right, this is a very clear path that I'm drawing. And it is a path, it is a map. But of course, in reality, the map is much more complicated, much more interesting. But this journey that we're taking, I think we're going to traverse the territory, we're going to traverse the you know, thousands of years of conversation in such a way that I think um, will give clarity to it. But I don't want to make it sound like it's like a very simple line. But we've gone from the, the standard negation to the mystical embrace of that negation to kind of like delineate the transcendent. And then from that, this negation of the transcendent in relation to the, the, the truth of theology for Feuerbach, which is anthropology, which is, you know, giving not, not, uh, not, com not communal wafers to people, but real bread to those who are starving, right? That's his kind of line. Not baptismal water that we can uh, come out of, but real water that people who are thirsty can drink. And then from that, we then jump in next week into more of what could be called the existential philosopher theologians, who take on board radically what these imminent thinkers are saying. They completely agree with it. And what they simply say is that in embracing love and justice and mercy, you are, uh, you are touching the heart of the ground of being. You are touching something transcendent not something that is above being that you contemplate, but in the very act of love itself, you participate in something that is greater than uh, imminent reality, something that grounds our imminent reality. So the most famous version of that is probably Paul Tillich. Uh, Paul Tillich, he talks about the ground of being. So he says, for example, if two people are arguing about whether God exists or not, and one is arguing that the church has done so much good for the world and points out lots of things that the church has done in the name of God or things that have been done in the name of God that are good. And then the other person's pointing out how things that have been done in the name of God have been terrible and how some of the churches have done some horrific things. Tillich says, well, they both agree on love and they both agree on uh, uh, justice. They both agree in the idea that, that people should be looked after and cared for. Uh, we should uh, help the world. And he says that shared commitment that they both have is a touching of the ground of being. So then there's that. And then in the last week, we get to the really interesting stuff. And this is um, where we look at some contemporary thinkers, uh, although this thought really gets into its own around the uh, 17th and 18th century, but look at some contemporary thinkers who see this negation that we're, that we're looking at, that we're dancing with all through these 40 days, bouncing around, dancing with this negation in different ways, that that negation is not just simply something that is useful for us, uh, that isn't just something that keeps us humble. It's not, um, uh, it's not something that is merely related to our finitude, but rather there's something of that negation that is in the heart of the absolute itself, that the ground of being is itself riven with negation. And this is where you get into a really interesting place where there's a critique that atheism is not atheistic enough, that for atheism, for the negation to fully uh, uh, flourish, uh, one has to see that this negation is part of the very reality, the very fabric of existence. And this is where then we hit the, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? where the absolute experiences this rupture within the absolute, which is a very significant notion in philosophy. And, it, and I don't think theology has actually grasped it that much. There's a few theologians I think have, but it's mostly been some philosophers who have grasped the philosophical significance of that idea. And we're gonna, we're gonna look at that. Now, I'm aware that as I talk about this, it sounds like it's gonna be incredibly heavy. And definitely there are some readings that are more difficult than others, but it's not all heavy stuff. Uh, it really is a mix 
there is music, there's readings, there's um, reflections, there's uh, TV, there's a, there's a short, my, I'm going to show the short film that I've been producing, uh, Mustard Seeds, uh, might not be called Mustard Seeds, but that's the working title. Um, so there's, there's going to be lots of different kind of media involved and lots of different ways into these, this thinking. But what I've tried to do is just paint a picture of, of how you're going to be going into the cloud of unknowing. Right, into the dark night of the soul, into the place of negation. That this is about you experiencing a radical decentering and destabilization. But you're not doing it alone. Right? To believe is easy. When we believe things, uh, we can do that on our own. To enter into a place of uh, rupture, we need community. That's why I used to say to believe is human, to doubt divine, right? If you're going to, if you're going to doubt and start to question, uh, it's very, very difficult. And you'll be doing this then with hundreds of actually thousands of other people. Uh, the last two Atheism for Lens, I think we've had over a thousand people engaging with it. And we've also had communities, whole, whole churches, whole communities doing it as well. I think we had a dozen last year. So you won't be doing this alone. There's a Facebook page where you can uh, engage with people, talk about how the readings and reflections are impacting you. And, um, uh, and I say, I'll be there every week trying to guide this journey. So that's Atheism for Lent. I think it starts on the 26th of, 6th of February. Um, I should have really looked before I jumped on the, online, but I'm gonna be working on it um, really, really from here on in. Uh, creating it. If you've done it before, I would say it'll be about 25% new material, which is like all my seminars are obviously new, and then there'll be like a, a few new reflections uh, dotted within it. But there'll also be some of the classic stuff from last year also in it. But I hope some of you who have done it before will join me again, and I'm hoping that some of you who have never done it will do it for the first time. Oh, I should say there's two ways to join. One is if you're on my Patreon at the, at the courses level, you just get free access to it, as with all of my other courses. I think there's about 10 of them now. Um, or you can just buy a one-off ticket. You can go onto my website, buy a one-off ticket, either for an individual or for a group. And uh, the difference is nothing. <laughs> it's just if you're going to do it with like 10 people, there's a, there's a more expensive ticket just to, you know, because you can all put money in together or whatever. Or you might have a budget. But, um, but basically it's 40 bucks you know, or, or 20 bucks via Patreon. And uh, that's for 40 reflections, 40 days of stuff, you know, six seminars, etc., etc. So if you're interested, jump on my website. Thanks very much for listening. Talk to you again soon.